Lee. And That's good. thank, no, no. thank I, you, thank you for the the comment in the chat to remind me to start that. Okay, so we're very honored and grateful and excited to have with us Catherine Poisserat today. And I'm sorry if I've gotten your last name not quite pronounced correctly. It's a challenge. <laughs> so she is a relatively new member of Writers in Kyoto and the leading non-Japanese expert on the Gion Festival. So she's created gionfestival.org and she's written an ebook guide to the festival. And do out practically any second now is if it's not already just out is her book, The Gion Festival, Exploring Its Mysteries. And I believe we're going to get some sneak uh, peeks at some of the content of that today. So she'll tell us about her, her um, what is it, her initial it, introduction to and involvement with the Gion Festival, but it started in the early 90s when she walked out of her front door one morning right into where the Kisan Kanon Yama float was being constructed. And she's been around the world since then, but still involved with Kyoto and the Gion Festival, and now is in the, uh, as we just mentioned, heard mentioned in uh, British Columbia and the Rockies there. And she's founded the Clear Sky Retreat Center there, and that's where she is joining us from today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Catherine. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, John. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, special thanks to writers in Kyoto. It's been a, a really lovely group to be a part of and came along for me just at the right time when I was wanting to write a book about Kyoto and you know didn't know how I would do that from Canada. So it's been super supportive and um, lovely to work with John and Lisa. And uh, special thanks to, to the Kyoto Journal crew who are also members. So I'd like to, we're having this presentation in honor of the Gion Festival, which as you know, normally takes place for the month of July. And most of the public portions have been canceled this month because of COVID. And we also wanted to celebrate the upcoming publication of my book, which um, it's one of those things that's been on the verge of being published for a few weeks now. I think it'll it'll probably be a few a few more weeks, but definitely uh, within the summer. And uh, please stay tuned. I'll I'll definitely let people know via the Writers in Kyoto Facebook and and my own Facebook channels, the Gion Festival Facebook channels. I am going to go ahead and share my screen and start with a slideshow, and I'll I'll switch from time to time between the slideshow and between this view. And uh, if you please do type questions in the chat and if I don't respond, it, it might just be because I haven't seen them because while I'm in slideshow, I can't see the questions. Um, so please enjoy. Lisa, can you see that, um, my s slide? Okay, great. I'd like to dedicate this to, uh, this is Mr. Nagai. I'd like to dedicate this presentation to he and his wife. He was, he just passed away about a year ago and uh, he was one of the lead movers at the Funeboko at the ship float. Oh, I apologize for that. I did do that already. Um, anyway, he's, uh, I learned so much from him, um, very kind hearted and generous person. And he just did enormous things for <coughs> serving the Gion Festival and Fune Boko float and, um, was, has been a real inspiration to me about how tradition can go together with, uh, modernization and adapting to change because he, he did a lot of breakthroughs, uh, for the Gion Festival. And I'll speak about those later on in this presentation. Okay, so here's my book cover. And um, I'm really excited for this to come out. I wanna share a little bit about why I'm qualified to speak about the Gion Festival and um, why I hope you'll read this book. It, it has been about 25 years or so in the making. Um, and so I'll say a bit more. 
And and by the way, in case you're wondering, you are free to share the material under the Creative Commons license. So that just goes with attribution, please. And, and this, you can take a screenshot or go to the Creative Commons website to learn more about that. It's a, it's a cool system. Oh, so this is what we're all missing this month. This is the lineup for the July 17th procession. And uh, yeah, it's been really pulling at my heartstrings to not be able to go to Kyoto this month as it probably has been for a lot of you. And um, I know that a lot of people within the Gion Festival community lobbied that the public portions of the festival should take place because the festival was originally founded to avert epidemics. And so, of course, people were saying, well, we have to put on the festival because that's what this festival was for. And I know that it was really a heartbreaking decision for the community to decide to not put people at risk by canceling the public portions of the festival. But they, they felt that that was the best decision. So this is where the, my association with the Gion Festival began. This was a house and garden that I lived in in the early 1990s. And a few people here have, have been to that house. Ken Rogers had been to that house. And it was just one of those kind of funny things in, oh, and Jory Johnson house sat for me at the time. And it was one of those fluke things where nobody was living there and um, somebody asked if we could and uh, we actually lived there for free. And um, it was in the Kita Kanonyama neighborhood. And as Lisa said one day, I walked out my door and I literally <coughs> asked a quote. And uh, I asked, what is this? And um, here we are 25 years later. Um, so this is me in about 1998. And um, let's see, my first experiences with the Gion Festival were actually in 1993. I was a regional correspondent for the Japan Times newspaper. And I wrote two articles on the festival. I was so bewitched by the festival when I first encountered it. I wrote two articles about it. And one was about the, just that year, they had done a survey on the international textile collection in the festival. This is one of the textiles. And um, there's a number of textiles like this in the Gion Festival. There's a, it's a type and there's quite a lot of, of textiles like this. There's so many that you sort of go, oh yeah, one of those, but they're actually very rare worldwide. And um, the survey revealed that. And so the Gion Festival attained a lot of status internationally from that survey. And the second article, the, oh, and it was um, co-authored by the former textile conservator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, so, so very authoritative. The second thing that I wrote about at that time was the participation of women in the festival. And uh, it was really neat. At the time, uh, one float, Kankoboko float, was considering allowing young girls to listen to the music rehearsals. And I just, I thought that was so behind the times. But here then, fi about 15 years later, I, I met the, the girls had become young women and, and they were full-fledged musicians on the float. And here's, here's two of them. The person on the left is, is one of them. Um, I also did some professional translation and editing for Yasaka Shrine, which is the parent shrine for Gion Festival. And I, I first, so I learned more there. And uh, Yasaka Shrine has very, very deep and interesting connections with the Gion Festival. And uh, one of my favorite fun factoids is you see dragons all around the Gion Festival. There's uh, artwork is full of dragons. And legend has it that the a blue dragon lives beneath the Yasaka Shrine main hall. And there's a pond down there and I, I went to the office and, and asked for confirmation. And I said, is there really a pond down beneath your main hall? And, and they confirmed that that was true. And um, so I'm, I'm very intrigued by that. Um, it's, so I hope you get a sense. There's a lot of intrigue in the Gion Festival and I, I got hooked very early and I just kept 
uh, I just kept my interest going. I, at one point I got a scholarship for the festival that fell through. And, um, but I was really determined not to let that stop me from pursuing my interest. And I became really close to members of the Gion Festival community and their kindness. Sorry about that, that was a bit fast. Their kindness and their commitment to the festival really impressed me. So I, I, they became my friends and, and people I wanted to see every summer. So that became another um, motivation as well. And through that, I, as a journalist, I worked a lot with sustainability and As a journalist, I worked a lot on sustainability issues, sustainable development and so on. And so I naturally became very interested in that aspect of the festival as well. It's been going for, as some of you know, over 1,150 years. And so I really consider it a, an international case study in sustainability that something can last that long. And it's considered the world's oldest urban festival. And um, because of the rapid pace of change in the world today, there are some considerable concerns about the sustainability of the festival moving forward. And I don't really hear that conversation happening very much. And so I, I would really like to contribute to that conversation in constructive ways because I think we have a role to play in helping the things that we love continue into the future so that other people can enjoy them. And especially those of us who are involved in some form of media, whether it's writing or teaching or artwork or so on, we have a real role to play in that in, in communicating to other people um, the importance of this and, and different ways that we can do this. Um, the next slide was of, um, well, well, actually, as most of you know, uh, so many things in Japan come back to Shinto and come back to Buddhism. It, it's just really inseparable from the culture. And so I, I became over time very interested in the spiritual aspects of these things. And at some point in the 90s, I, I became a meditator and became very interested in, in that practical, you know, practicing the things that they talk about at the temples and so on. And it was through that that I, I grew to appreciate that the Gion Festival is really a gigantic shamanic ritual. Uh, I, and it was one of those aha moments and I, I was amazed how long it took me to figure that out. But it's, it is a purification ritual. And I really have no idea. I think the numbers of people who consciously consider it that are quite small. But if you think of the heat, the humidity, the crowds, the music, which is actually designed to invite altered states of consciousness, and the, um, the two to three hour walk that they do on the processions, the carrying the heavy weight of the Makoshi in the processions. And I'll come back to, to this later in the presentation. But these are all the classic hallmarks of, of um, what's it called, shugyo, um, ascetic practices. Um, putting the body through very challenging experiences in order to induce altered states. And um, one gentleman actually um, shared that with me one time. I asked him, if, if you've ever climbed on a float, they're actually quite small inside where, where the musicians go. And I asked a man who was there, who was one of the musicians, how many men and boys were in there at a time. And he, he said up to 50. And I couldn't believe they could fit that many people in that small of a space together with their sacred statues. And he must have seen the astonishment on my face. And he said, yeah, it is an ascetic practice. We are in there and we're concentrating and playing music and, and really elbow to elbow the whole time. So um, 
I, I find that fascinating. And I find that as a participant, and, and especially because I've been doing research all of these years, I would, I would run around all day in the heat and uh, sort of unintentionally exhaust myself carrying heavy camera equipment and um, challenging myself, you know, by, by keeping the Japanese language going all day long and those sort of things. And, and um, with the music playing, I, I thought, you know, this is, this is really true. You get that sense of the floating world that is so famous in Japanese culture that there's just a, uh, it's, it's something different from, from our everyday life. So this, this in particular interests me. And, and I think that this is really, crucial for the sustainability of the festival is a respect for its function as a purification ritual. And, and what better way to rid the world of evil spirits and, and uh, illness than through purification. That's, that's basically what all spiritual practices come down to. So um, I'll go back to my slides. So, uh, Gosh, I sure do love Kyoto, but ironically, we couldn't find any place to meditate there. So as Lisa commented, um, well, it looks like it might do this every time. Sorry about this. It didn't do this last night when Lisa and I tested it. Um, so that's how I ended up in Canada. Um, my, my meditation teacher and my partner is Canadian. And so we founded this beautiful retreat center named Clear Sky in the British Columbia Rockies. And so uh, we teach together here at Clear Sky. That's our physical retreat center and also through an organization called Planet Dharma. That's a kind of virtual platform for our teaching. So, so who cares about the spiritual aspect of, of something like the Gion Festival? Well, look, here's the website for Stanford Medical School, the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. And uh, some of you may be familiar with HeartMath, which is a lot of scientists who got together and found um, scientifically proven methods that are basically grounding and breathing exercises. And I don't mean to dismiss those or, or speak of them lightly, but they've researched scientifically uh, grounding and breathing exercises in order to help people get more centered in their heart. So now they're doing worldwide events where people get together and uh, meditate for the end of COVID, for example. So when you think of something like the Gion Festival that has more than a thousand years of experience, basically in this what we consider a cutting edge field, I think there is really something interesting to be found in this ancient festival that's very applicable to our modern lives and, and this quote unquote cutting edge field. And, and here's Canon. Um, this is incredibly beautiful statue is at Minami Canon Yama. And um, I, I think about this a lot when I go to the different floats. Each float has there are deities that pertain to the entire Gion festival, and then each float has its own deity or deities. And Canon, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, is, is the deity for Minami and Kita Kanon Yama. And um, so I, I think about this, wow, what does that do to a neighborhood if they have centuries of experience of, of the entire neighborhood rallying around this principle of compassion and I for example with these floats and I find that I find that very compelling and um, and interesting and and worthy of, of further exploration um, oh okay so fast forward 20 years and this is 2018 and here is Diane Durston who the author of uh, the wonderful book Old Kyoto and she invited me to present on the Gion Festival at a Gion Festival event at the Portland Japanese Garden, a, a really wonderful place. If you have not been, I, I highly recommend it. And um, she's been remarkably supportive. And um, this is what persevering in, in our fields can, can result in, right? It's uh, a bit of blood, sweat, and tears, and, and gambate. And, um, yeah, we can enjoy, enjoy then sharing the fruits of our labor with other people.
Okay, so this is this float is um, Abura Tenjin Yama. So Tenjin, as as many of you know, is um, the spirit for Sugawara Michizane. He was a tremendous scholar in Heian period Kyoto, about the ninth century, and he was wronged. He was badly done by, and he was unjustly exiled and uh, died of, of sorrow, missing Kyoto, as, as some of us can probably relate to. And um, mysteriously, after, after that, the people who did him wrong uh, started dying in strange ways, and the capital was afflicted by thunder and, and the palace burnt down. And, and people attributed it to his angry spirit. And so an angry spirit, and I have to thank Masashi Nakamura for pointing this out to me, an angry spirit is called an onryo in Japanese. It's an angry, vengeful spirit. Now, the thing about these is that they can be converted. We can supplicate an angry spirit. We can try to please them. We can apologize. We can make offerings. We can live a virtuous life. And, and the onryo, if so inspired, will become a goryo, which is a benevolent spirit. And um, Sug uh, Sugiwara's spirit in, in its earliest days was considered an angry, vengeful spirit. And as we know, or, or as we know now, today it's highly respected and considered extremely benevolent. People pray to him for success and in exams and pray to him if, if we feel badly wronged for, for solace. And so he morphed into a godyo, into a helpful, benevolent spirit. And this is a classic mark of any kind of shamanism worldwide. It's, it's all about expelling negative spirits or expelling negativity, we'll say negative energy, and transforming it into something more positive. And in psychological terms, that is called integrating our shadow. We take our fears, our deepest fears, our shame, we explore it, we accept it, and from those things, we become kinder and more compassionate people who are able to better help others. And so I just love the Gion Festival as a massive example with, with many, many different facets we can say 34 different facets for the 34 floats of, of how this can take place. So this is um, Shinsen In. Uh, some of you will recognize this. And uh, please forgive me if I'm mis mispronouncing things. My, my Japanese is getting pretty rusty. But this is on Oike Dori in central Kyoto, and it's the remnants of the ancient imperial palace. And amazingly, this is where the original Goryo A took place. That was what the first emperor called what we now know as the Gion Festival in the year 869. He called it a Goryo A, which means a meeting of benevolent spirits. So the, the, the capital was experiencing a terrible plague at the time. And they believed it was because of angry spirits wreaking revenge on the population. But did they call it a meeting of angry spirits? No, they called it a meeting of benevolent spirits. So already the emperor was kind of using the power of his intention and the power of words to, to invite that transformation to take place. And we don't have historical records of what happened, but the next time there was a plague, he held another Godyo A, and then he held another one. And let's see, that was the year 869 it began, and by the year 1000, it was an annual event. And of course, that's because of the annual rainy season that takes place every July. And now we know that um, the pestilence was probably things like cholera and um, dysentery and those sort of hygiene-related illnesses that, that come from standing water. Now, those illnesses, they, they call it summer sickness. They still call it that in Kyoto. And um, elderly people today still have that experience of when they were children, their siblings and their family members were still dying in the 1950s from the summer sickness. And I speak to elders in the Gion Festival and they still say, like, oh, when we get into August, we know we've made it another year. So it's still, and, and as you know, we get into August in Obon, 
and that's the ghost season, right? When all the ghosts come out. So um, this is really central to the to the culture of of Kyoto. So it was sometime later. This is Yasaka Shrine. This is the Naginata Boka floats Chigo San, or Chigo means literally celestial child. And um, it was sometime later that the what we know as the Gyeon Festival became related to Yasaka Shrine. It's unclear exactly when. Yasaka Shrine is actually older than the city of Kyoto. It dates back to the 600s. And uh, Kyoto was founded in the, I believe, the late 700s. Now, um, Yasaka Jinja is the patron shrine of the Gyeon Festival. The Gyeon Festival is officially a Yasaka Shrine Festival. And the deity, the resident deities at Yasaka Shrine are Susano no Mikoto, who is the younger brother. He's the god of storms. So, okay, we see this connection, the, the summer rains, the pestilence brought by that, that and, and who else, who better to connect with about the problems associated with that than the god of storms. Um, again, he can bring storms or he can protect us from storms. And so the, the idea of, of communicating with him is to try to get him to, to help us rather than bring harmful things. Um, so he's the main resident deity at Yasaka Shrine. Also his wife, uh, um, Inada, Kushi Inada Hime. So she is the goddess of rice. And uh, they call it the third deity is a group of their eight children. And so we'll see later in the images, um, there's three Mikoshi, three portable floats, and it's for those three deities. Now, just a word about the Chigo. Um, there's just a small number of living Chigo. Most of them have been replaced by sacred statues. Um, Naginata Bokos is the only one to still ride on a float. And uh, again, very classic shamanic feature where children are often used as pure vessels for basically become vehicles for spirits. And uh, with the floats, they have those tall spires linking the heaven and the earth. And it's believed that the, the spirits can come down those spires onto the float and um, take up residence in the body of the Chigo. Now, I've never heard anybody talk about this in contemporary times. But again, this is a classic feature of, of any kind of shamanism in cultures worldwide. This is Susano no Mikoto in the middle here, and here he's defeating in the left panel, there's a dragon, and that's Yamato, Yamata no Orochi, the eight-headed dragon, and on the right is Kushi Inada Hime, the, the goddess of rice. So Susano no Mikoto defeated this, slayed this dragon uh, by getting him drunk, incidentally, got the eight heads drunk. You can see kind of eight pots of sake and um, took advantage of that opportunity to slay the dragon and, and um, then became a couple with the princess of rice. Okay, so here are the three Mikoshi. And these are on display on, or let's see, open for public almighty, for pilgrimages, for, for the public to come and pay their respects at Yasaka Shrine um, before July 17th, a few days before July 17th. And then they're taken to the Otabisho, the traveling place in central Kyoto, right around Shijo Teramachi. And that's the Shinkosai. It's when men carry these three on their shoulders. They weigh about four tons each. And this is really the spiritual heart of the Gion Festival, is, is what happens with these deities. And when the deities travel through Kyoto, they, they go on these very roundabout routes. And the idea is for them to bless the streets of central Kyoto, bless the streets of all the parishioners of, of the Yasaka Shrine and um, to, to bring good things for the ensuing year. Now the second, um, another deity associated with Yasaka Shrine is um, Gozu Tenno. And this, that's what this um, hanging scroll says. 
it says Gozu Tenno, which means ox headed emperor. So before Shinto and Buddhism were separated, Yasaka Shrine was also known as Gion Sha or Gion Shrine. Now, Gion is a translation, a Japanese translation for Jetta Grove, which is where the Buddha gave his first sermons. It was the Buddha's first monastery, it was in Jetta Grove. And Gozu Tenno was a protector deity of Jetta Grove. So um, he was considered very powerful, and so the Japanese invited him, probably via Korea, to or modern day Korea, to um, be a protector deity at Gyeongsha, right? The protector of Jetta Grove. Um, the Buddhist portion of Yasaka Shrine was named after Jetta Grove, so they bring the protector here. Now, another uh, pictorial representations of the, the Gozu Tenno, the ox headed emperor, are very rare, but you will see this scroll at almost every float with offerings given to it. This is Suzuka Yama, and this is an unusual depiction of the goddess Suzuka. Now, another connection with the ox headed emperor is that there is a Buddhist deity, particularly in Mikyo, in um, esoteric Buddhism, uh, named Yamantaka, who is an a deity with an ox's head and he is considered the lord of death and he's considered a guardian of the threshold between this world and the next and so again we see this this principle of, of protection from death protection from harm and and so we can say that really the Gion festival is all about impermanence it's all about this very real possibility that well we could die at any moment and if you were a kyoto native up until the 1950s there was a, a higher chance you might die in july and and that's what this festival is is really about and for me it's very interesting because the um my friends in the gion festival are quite elderly um and and i've known them now for about 25 years and and so it really rings true for me because every year i don't know whether or not I'll be able to meet them again. Every year I don't know um, if I'm saying goodbye for the last time. And I felt that very keenly with Nagai-san, who I dedicated this presentation to. I, I was very fond of him and I, I, I was really sad when one year I went and he wasn't there anymore. So um, it, it gives us a lot to, it reminds us of the preciousness of this human life because none of us know we could go at any time. And so it's a and so we celebrate. So we celebrate with these beautiful floats and uh, music and lights and uh, food and drink and dancing um, to, to make the most of the time that we have here. Okay, so I, I'd like to talk about some contemporary challenges that the Gion Festival is facing. And um, well, before I go there, I'll say um, we are all a bit heartbroken that the Gion Festival isn't happening this year, but this is not the first time this has taken place. Um, it's not the first time parts of it has been canceled, and sometimes parts of it have been rescheduled for later in the year. So the best known time is during the Onan War in the, 14, in the late 1400s. The Gion Festival ceased entirely for about 30 years. And, and that's basically because most of Kyoto was burned to the ground. The destruction was very serious. And when it was revived, it was revived in the year 1500 by order of the Shogun. The Shogun ordered that it be started up again. He wanted the population to have something to celebrate. And that was a real turning point in the Gion Festival. It went from being a kind of aristocratic ritual, very highly ritualized ritual, to then it became more like what we know it as today, which is really a festival of the people and a townspeople festival. And uh, it, it was very much a merchants festival, very much a kimono merchants festival. And it's quite remarkably democratic uh, and has been since well before democracy became common. And uh, that's an interesting feature of it. 
Um, just a few other cancellations. Uh, Post-war, the U.S. occupation forbade public gatherings, and, and so much of the public events in the Guillaume Festival were canceled. And uh, it was canceled during cholera, during a cholera outbreak, during the Meiji era. Um, the float processions were also canceled when the Hankyu Railway was built. So, so just to know, it's a little, it's mildly less heartbreaking when we know that there's a precedent and we can look forward to the next celebration. Okay, so back to kimono. Um, well, the kimono merchants, so where the Gion Festival takes place, is really the center of the kimono universe. And when I lived there in the 1990s, it was just kimono, kimono dyers, kimono um, wholesalers, kimono silk vendors, kimono retailers. It was just kimono, kimono, kimono. And kimono merchants have really been the patrons of the Gion Festival for centuries. And as most of you know, post bubble, the kimono industry has collapsed and the kimono merchants that are still remaining do not have those kinds of funds to be the patrons that they have always been. And so this is just an incredible shift. If for about maybe 400 years or 500 years, kimono merchants have been the patrons of the Gion Festival, and now they cannot be that anymore. And so there's a, a big financial shift happening right now. And the government, um, national, prefectural, and municipal government have all been very supportive and, and provided subsidies and fundings. But of course, with that always goes a lot of paperwork. And of course, with that always come a lot of strings attached. And so that's really shifting the nature of the festival as well. Now for people who are big photography fans or textile fans or just beauty fans, there's also the Gion Festival used to be called the Kimono Festival. And it's really hard to call it that now because scenes like this are harder and harder to come by. If you're a photographer, you can wait around for a long time before you get a woman walking by in a kimono like this. And um, so if there are people, if you're ever tempted to wear yukata or kimono to the Gion Festival, I really encourage you to do that because it's a long-standing tradition and it's such an important industry for Kyoto and for the Gion Festival. So I think supporting that is, I, I, I feel it's important. I try to do that myself. So just to give you a sample, this is, uh, I think this is Yoi Yoi Yama. I think this is two nights before the procession on the 17th. So this is less crowded than the following night. <laughs> Uh, remember, we were talking about the ascetic practices involved in the Gion Festival. I really consider the Yoyama an ascetic practice, just being in this crush. And um, it can really take you an hour to go uh, one street block because of the throng. It's a lot, it's better now that the festival has been separated into two parts again since 2014. Uh, maybe it's not quite as serious, but, but the reason I'm showing this slide is if you look here, there there are not many people wearing kimono or yukata. And I actually took this photo because of the young woman in the front center right there who is wearing one. I kind of was standing there for a while waiting for somebody to come up wearing one and, and then I was waiting for a while. And so here you see me in action um, supporting the <laughs> uh, kimono tradition. And interestingly, I was wearing this kimono and a kimono merchant came up to me and he said, um, he says, I'm really shocked. I came from Gifu Prefecture. I wanted to be inspired by the kimono at the Gion Festival. And he says, I never, he says, your kimono is the one that I like the most. And I really, he says, I don't mean to be rude, but I never thought in a million years that a foreigner would be wearing the kimono I like the most. And so that kind of tells you something about how much it's changed. And interestingly, he recreated this kimono. He took photos on it and, and had it custom ordered for, for somebody else, of course. This is at um, Naginata Boko Float. Okay, so that's a, um, a word about the challenges with kimono. And, and I, just to let you know, I'm going to follow up with some of the more hopeful developments. It's by no means is it all bad news. There's some really great things happening as well. Um, and 
I'd like to also touch on the challenge faced in the architecture. And I think this shot gives a good feeling for, um, so in front of us, we have some traditional buildings. That's probably one compound. It's usually on either a long, narrow strip of buildings that are in one um, piece of property or sometimes a courtyard. So those three buildings are, pr are probably all one property and there may be another building to the right. And so we can see, right, where the parking lot is, that used to be another complex, another piece of property. And uh, behind it, where the apartment building is, would have been another property. So we can get a sense for, it's more financially viable for someone to knock that compound down and build a parking lot of, I counted, there's 13 spaces here. It's more economically viable to make a 13 space hourly parking lot or to make that high rise than to conserve these traditional buildings. And I think there's, um, it's definitely getting better. Um, there's a really interesting and um, vit vital, like it has vitality and movement to conserve traditional architecture in Kyoto and, and that is awesome. And um, I think there's room for improvement with Kyoto conserving its buildings with traditional architecture. There's a lot of UNESCO preserved buildings, all the temples, a lot of temples that are preserved, but in terms of residences and businesses, I think Kyoto could uh, really learn from other world cultural capitals. Um, and I look forward to that. And again, as uh, writers and teachers and as artists, I think that we have a role to play to to um, help support that happening. Because why would we do this? Well, because we love traditional architecture. This is probably the most photographed building in the Gion Festival. This is uh, Mumeisha, the home of uh, Yoshida Sensei, again in the Kita Kanonyama um, neighborhood. And uh, he does a beautiful Byobu Matsuri. A Byobu Matsuri is a sub-festival within the Gion Festival where residents will uh, open the, the front of their house like this, either open the windows or um, take out the windows as he does here, and then display heirlooms and, and other artwork. And that curved thing there, that's a piece of a Gion Festival float wheel that um, is being upcycled as a decoration. So again, this is probably the most, it's, it's definitely one of the most largest, he has a beautiful art collection. It's one of the best Byobu Matsuri displays, um, probably most photographed. And, you know, we love it so much. So it's in our own best interest to conserve the things that, that we love. And I say that partly because I've, I've been watching some of these places that we love um, go bankrupt and disappear and get sold and, and often sold to uh, nothing against our friends in Tokyo, but often sold to Tokyo buyers um, who are keen to have a property in Kyoto, but just don't have the connection to the Gion Festival and don't maybe have the knowledge, maybe don't have the wherewithal to be involved in the Gion Festival or to conserve these traditions. And um, yeah, so, so there's room for, it, for bridges to be made there, for connections to be made, for education to happen. This is across the street from the previous photo and um, this is a, uh, this is a very typical uh, happening in the Gion Festival neighborhood. This is a new hotel and uh, these are some people watching the Gion Festival. So, so here is what happens. This used to be the Matsuzakaya department store, historic department store, beautiful historic building, um, maybe 250 years old. Um, had a beautiful Byobu Matsuri because the business had been there for 250 years. They had um, artwork from 250 years ago that they would put on display, beautiful kimono, beautiful Byobu, um, beautiful samurai costumes. And uh, Matsuzukaya fell on hard times. They sold the building. Uh, it was purchased, knocked down, and this hotel was put up. And then the irony is that people come and stay in the hotel because they want to come to the Gion Festival. So, so this is what is happening, and this is what doesn't need to happen. We're kind of people who want to take part in the festival. We are inadvertently destroying the festival so that we can enjoy it. 
and um, it doesn't need to be this way. And so uh, I look forward to raising awareness about this so that we can um, help people be more than voyeurs of, a, of, of such a great thing as the Gion Festival. And, and this, of course, what I'm saying can be applied to many different uh, events and locations and so on around the world. So I think the movement for cultural sustainability is really just in its very early stages. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to being a part of this, you know, as a lover of Kyoto. Um, gosh, how could I not be? It's just, a, it's just such a great thing to be involved in. And, and, and points to the hotel, they put up the Noran curtain, they put up the lantern, so, so they're trying, right? They're, they're trying to participate and support the festival. Um, so you saw that early photo of the house that I lived in. This is what replaced it. The building on the right is what replaced it. So that, that apartment building is um, one very large apartment building replaced my traditional home and garden and, and neighboring traditional home and garden and a kimono company. So those three properties were knocked down for this apartment building. Now what's interesting is this is actually a success story because this is in Koyama neighborhood, the carp float. And they did a really good job of everyone who moves into this apartment building gets an introduction to the Gion Festival and is invited to participate. And they've been very, they've been able to very skillfully invite new people to participate together with traditional residents. And you can kind of imagine the culture clash if somebody moves here from a different part of Kyoto or somebody moves here from out of town and doesn't really know anything about the Gion Festival and shows up to help, well, there's you know just worlds of difference between the consciousness of these people, right? Someone from out of town and, and someone who's been living in the Gion Festival neighborhood for generations. And so the fact that Koyama was able to, has been able to um, bring these two different communities together skillfully is, is really a great achievement. So this is Sugimoto K, the Sugimoto family home, the 12th generation of Sugimotos lives here. And this is where the Hakugayama float um, is displayed each year. And um, very important, and it's the largest uh, traditional home, the largest kyomatia in the city. So um, very valuable, uh, they do open to the public each year during the Gion Festival and very wonderful to visit and and our visit the proceeds go towards conservation so a really great cause worth supporting. This is Adare Tenjinyama and um, this is a typical form of Kyoto downtown Kyoto architecture a long narrow alleyway and then it opens up to a courtyard in the back. And uh, you can walk right by this door and miss it during the festival, but it's so peaceful and cool and quiet inside. I, I really recommend taking the time to go into these smaller, quieter floats because they're so lovely and a really wonderful oasis from the heat in the crowds. So when we talk about the Gion Festival and these traditional buildings really represent a way of life that um, has been going on in this area for hundreds of years. And, and that way of life is really linked to the festival. And of course it's changing and, and uh, we can't stop change and you know, don't want to stop change, but I think we, we can really get much better at um, making choices about how we change and um, yeah, trying to make the best choices that we can as, as change happens. And I really tried to write my book with this in mind, with this really strong element of education and this really strong element of, if, if we go to the festival, we're, in a way we're part of that community, in a way we're participating in the festival, right? We're not, we're not just voyeurs on an experience, but, but we, um, especially those of us who, again, are involved in communications and those of us who have been living in, a, in Kyoto for a long time.
This is, um, so the gentleman I dedicated this slide presentation to, Mr. Nagai and his wife, Haruko. This is their traditional home on the left here. That's Nagai K, K means home. And so it's the Nagai family residence. And um, they moved away from Kyoto and he passed away. And this, uh, their home is now being conserved by a real estate development company who, who says they'd like to use it as a show for traditional architecture. And um, so it's really worth uh, visiting. It's a beautiful home. It's open to the public during the festival. And it's really worth letting the owners know, letting the staff know that you value, that we value their efforts to conserve this building. Again, it's about how we can participate, right? And how we can um, play a role in conserving what we love. Okay, so another um, challenge that the Gion Festival is, is facing, this is my, uh, my friend Matsumiya-san and I. I interviewed him for one of those early articles on women's participation at, or girls' participation at Kankoboko. And um, it's kind of a funny story because I, I actually, you know, I was like a 24-year-old American woman and, and I, just, I just thought they were, you know, oh, you're thinking about letting girls participate or in the rehearsals, are you? I just thought they were moving way too slow and, you know, it was sexist and I don't think I, I think I shared my feelings probably pretty um, audibly. And um, it's, it's nice because 25 or more years later, he and I are good friends. And um, this year he turns 100. And um, so he's really one of those people. I, I don't know if I'll see him again. And um, yeah, we have been through a lot together over 25 years. And so he would have been uh, around 80 when, when I first met him. And so I, it's to give you a sense of that the along with the entire Japanese population, the Gion Festival population is also silvering, right, is, is becoming older. And the average age is, is quite elderly. And one of the reasons this is so important, well, well, these elders are really vessels of knowledge and experience. And they may or may not have younger people to pass that knowledge and experience to. It's also significant because it's, a, it's a physically a very challenging festival. You really need to have um, the knowledge and experience of older people, but also the strength and vitality of younger people to carry around all this heavy stuff, you know, all this, the wood beams for the floats and move the wheels and stuff. And, um, and there's definitely a challenge and there's definitely a gap where now that in previous years when there were those big traditional Japanese buildings, a lot of them were homes, a lot of them were homes and companies, and most people lived and worked in the same neighborhood. And so everybody said, okay, it's Gion Festival's on, and everybody rallied, and all the employees went to work for the floats, and all of the companies either closed for the month or had a light month because everybody was working on the festival. Well, now people, most people work elsewhere. And so if you work in a different town or a different neighborhood and you say, uh, it's Gion Festival, can I have the month off? Well, I, I, I don't imagine many people say yes to that. And so they're experiencing a, a challenge with this. And, um, and, and once more, I am going to get to the good news. There are some, some really good developments coming out of this. Um, another, another aspect of this is, well, one of the reasons that I think there aren't more young people involved is because um, you can imagine Matsumiya-san here doesn't know how to use social media, right? Or how to, I'm, a lot of my friends in the GAM Festival don't have email. And um, so there's just a very practical problem of, you know, young people don't necessarily know what the Gion Festival is about because it's not well represented in social media. So um, there's that challenge as well, that, technolo that technology gap. Okay, so we're getting to the good news. I just wanna take a pause here and see 
if there are some questions. Um, I'm happy to take some questions now, or I can just keep going. We did have an earlier question about whether or not the floats are still being built this year, even though the, the public um, gathering portion of the festival is not taking place. Yeah, thanks, Lisa. Uh, no, the the floats, as, as far as I understand, I um, as I mentioned, a lot of my friends do not have email, so I, I mostly rely on seeing them in person, or sometimes we correspond by um, post <laughs> by letters or by um, postcards or sometimes I telephone people but so people in Kyoto may know better than I do but as far as I understand that it's been kind of prohibited to build the floats this year um, I know that lanterns are being hung and music is being played and they're finding some occasions they're holding some rituals at Yasaka Shrine which are from what I understand close to the public but um, that that are taking place Okay. Think. Oh, one just came in. I'll let you go ahead and take that. Do you see it? Okay. Hello. Thanks for the question. About the dragon god. Is a dragon god still seen as an onyo that has become a godyo? Um that's a really good, that's a really good question. The dragon god, the Ryujin, is is represented at Fune Boko float, at the boat float. And that is related to this fascinating story of when Empress Jingu traveled to what is the modern day Korean peninsula. Um, she was supposedly helped by the dragon god. He gave her two jewels. And, and this is all straight out of the Kojiki and the Nihongi, the two oldest history books for Japan. He gave her two jewels to control the tides. One controlled the high tide and one controlled the low tide. And so it was said that she used those jewels, firstly, to arrive safely in the uh, modern day Korean peninsula and then to land very easily. And that was supposedly key to her success. They say that she conquered um, what was then called the Sila Kingdom without any battle. And um, I don't mean to make too big a deal out of it, but if you take a really remarkable woman who travels to a foreign country and, and conquers it with no battle, and it's ruled by a king, and she comes back and has a baby, I think there is a different interpretation of that story that we could take very seriously. Um, now the dragon, the blue dragon is different from the Ryujin. The, the blue dragon we see everywhere is a, one of the protectors of the four directions in Feng Shui. And uh, it's the protector of the east. And so that's a protector animal deity different from Ryujin, the dragon god. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, older people don't use social media, but how about newer involvement of university age supporters? Yeah, great question. Um, Ken, so we do see some promising developments. I heard that um, university students that volunteer at Kanko Boko each year made a YouTube video in honor of, of they wanted to participate somehow in the festival. So they made a YouTube video for Kanko Boko, which is apparently available on their channel and I didn't wasn't I didn't really know they had a channel actually I think that Tina your son might have something to do with Kanko Boko having a YouTube channel right Tina's son is doing some virtual reality video and he did 360 degree video for Kanko Boko um, so there are some things like that and that's very much a work in progress it's it's just very challenging for people who've been doing this for decades to, you know, how do you empower brand new people who are new to this festival to represent you to the public? That's, that's a tough question. And especially if you take someone who's 80 and doesn't know anything about social media, you know, what kind of permission to give someone who's 20? Um, that's a very fertile, area to explore and, and a very tricky one. 
Yeah, the um, Rich and Macon project. I'll get to that, Ken. So, so Rich and Macon. I'll, I'll, I'm actually I've got several slides on that, so I'll I'll leave that for a little bit. You saw uh, John Asino, Yasaka Shrine Ritual with three or four Chigo. Apart from the leading flow, what do the others do? Right. So the Chigo are well, they're so attractive, they're so darling. That so Ayagasa Boko float has six Chigo children. Um, Ayagasa Boko doesn't have a float that you ride on. They have an incredible dance and music and the Chigo walk along with the umbrella foots. And then the Yasaka Shrine has two Chigo and those are the ones that you sometimes see on horseback. So, um, and Nagi Mataboka's Chigo is kind of most famous because it's the first float and because it's the only one on a float and because NHK films the same scene every year of the float opening with Nagi Nataboko's Chigo. And um, Gion Festival, people have some opinions about that, right? Because it's, it's such a diverse festival. Why show the same scene every year? But it is the opening and it's, it's very attractive. Okay, yes, this would be a very good time for a comfort break. Thank you, Lisa. All right, and thank you, John, for suggesting that. All right, so most people I think are in their homes. Is, is five minutes sufficient or should we take 10? Does anybody just wanna chime in for a moment there with a cast a vote? Five, okay, let's do five. I've got six after. Um, so let's, let's come back maybe at 11, 12 after. We'll just see when we have sort of the, you know, when we all have our faces back here. Um, okay, see you in five or six minutes. All right, I see most of us are back. Maybe there are a couple of people who are actually present and they just have their uh, their video stopped for the moment. So uh, I think we should maybe go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks, Lisa. Um, Victoria, thank you for your questions. I'm so glad you asked those. So the first question is, through the lens of heritage tourism, how is the Gion Festival marketed to Japanese people? Um, I would say that it's marketed, it's got a very strong tourism bent, and it is marketed as an amazing cultural, um, as an amazing cultural event. And I think one of the things that's been so rewarding for me is, is just realizing 
how different our perceptions are, um, culturally different our perceptions are, and of course, individually different too. And, and how we can all bring something important to the table. So there are some really beautiful books on the Gion Festival in Japanese that are very well done, um, very high standards, excellent information that, that have helped me a lot. And they're very much object focused. And the, the things that I'm sharing about the, the meaning of the festival and the community participation in the festival, I have not seen this covered anywhere in, in um, for a Japanese audience. And I may just be unaware of it. It may ha be happening somewhere, but, but I don't think so. And so um, th that's why I'm concerned about the sustainability of the festival is because I don't see that conversation. There's a celebration of the culture and the heritage for Japanese people, but not really a like, and here's how we can help it keep happening for another thousand years. Um, and, and it's starting to happen. I, I did hear that City Hall is looking, there's a department for um, Kyoto reaching its sustainable development goals, which I believe is a United Nations initiative. And, and someone is looking at the Gion Festival through that lens. And, and that's all I know on the subject, but that's a very promising development. And, and somebody approached me about that. Um, it is almost not at all marketed to international audiences. And I believe that is an unintended consequence of amazing success with their marketing to Japanese people. So it, it, um, Kyoto City and maybe Kyoto Prefecture too, I'm not sure, decided, I'm not exactly sure when, but maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago to really up the marketing to a Japanese audience to come to Kyoto for the Gion Festival. And that's been so successful that they are really at capacity for the number of visitors that they can handle. And um, I think they're working well with it. Um, it's, it's, they're promising, it's getting better every year, but I think there's been a decision not to market it internationally. Um, to what level do you think the average visitor is aware of the cultural histories and on what level do you feel the education? Okay, I'm gonna answer that one first. It totally depends on the person. I have heard that people go to the Gion Festival and don't actually know that there are floats, that they go for the kind of street scene, which is amazing, and just like eat food at the street stalls and hang out to see and be seen and, and go home. And, um, so some people are like that. I did, I met a woman, um, we were at a float that happens to have textiles depicting scenes of Taoism. And this woman, this Japanese woman, I felt bad for her because she looked so bored. We were talking and she was sitting there like, get me out of here, that kind of look on her face. And so I was just trying to help her feel better. And I said, oh, did you see this yin yang symbol on this textile? And she actually said, she's like, what, yin yang? I studied Taoism. You mean this festival actually means something? That, that's almost a direct quote. And she jumped up and she went and she looked at the float. So somehow she got invited to the festival enough to be get into a float that is not open to the public. And she didn't know that it was meaningful. So, so there's growth that, you know, there's room for us to work there. Um, what level do you feel, do I feel this education is important in responsible culture, heritage, tourism, consumption? Absolutely. So that's kind of my raison d'etre. <laughs> and um, that, yeah, I, I wrote my book with that very much in mind. So, so, so stay tuned. I hope, I hope my book is helpful for your research. So John Bielu Festival in particular seems much reduced over the past 20 years. And I heard part of the factors mentioned was partly due to problems caused by mass tourism. Um, yeah, I, I think it's actually increasing in some areas. And I know that some homes have closed and it's, it's because we had bad manners and I have to include myself in that. Um, you know, I, I, I walked into a home where I kind of knew I shouldn't and um, I never saw them have a biobu out again. And so I have never done that since, but I, I think that's, Speaking again to Victoria's questions, I think there is not uh, education for their, for tourists, and I think that um, people are 
over we overstep our boundaries and it becomes very uncomfortable for some of the people doing the Biobu festival and i've heard of um, people have said that people eat eat food with their hands and then touch folding screens and i've heard that people um, take things um, and and not malintended just ignorant just not knowing any better so um they didn't have to do that and now the onus is kind of on the private individuals to make signs or you know and then again it's elderly people who don't necessarily have computers so how are they going to make a sign something that a 20 year old could do very easily um anyhow but i i think we will definitely go in that direction because um people want to continue doing the biobu festival and hachimanyama in particular is I think has more than it used to have, and they're really making a concerted effort. So, so it's promising. It's um, there. There is good news. Um, you're welcome, Victoria. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen again. I, I just I want to say too, like just how passionate the people who put on the Gion Festival, they really want to share, you know, and they really want to find ways that they can. So, so that is just one of the reasons these people are so amazing. Okay, I am hitting play and it's not getting any bigger. So I'm sorry about that. I don't know, I don't know why that isn't happening. So I'll make this a bit smaller and we'll just have to go anyway. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I want to get to some of these positive developments. And so we talked about the financial troubles with the collapse of the kimono industry. So one of the really neat things that's happened, this is O Funeboka, which means great ship float. And it's kind of the darling of the Ato Matsuri. It came back in 2014. And this was in maybe, I think, 2012. They were doing fundraising. They were doing public fundraising. There was an exhibit. This was all of the float that they had paid for so far, you know, they'd invested in so far. And they just had a public fundraising campaign, basically crowdfunding before Kickstarter and Indiegogo got to Japan, I guess. And um, it was humongously successful. They raised a lot of money, uh, more than a million US dollars in a very short period of time. So if this was maybe 2012, 2011, um, by 2014, wow, okay, this was unexpected, I'm sorry. Okay, so I'm gonna um, close this program and restart it. So thank you for your patience and I apologize for that. But hopefully that'll solve our problems. So uh, by 2014, the float was um, constructed enough that they could participate in the July 24th procession. So I think they were doing that public fundraising for maybe about five years or so. So that's, that's really fast, especially since I don't think that kind of thing had ever been undertaken before. Um, I've got the image back, so I'm gonna to try to share screen again. Okay, so here's the Fune Boko in 2014. That's how far they got in, in just another two years. So that's phenomenal. Now Ta Takayama is now wanting to come back in by the year 2022. And um, I, I believe they're also doing the same kind of crowdfunding. And so that speaks so much to, you know, how much Japan loves the Gion Festival, you know, how much the public is willing to support it. So it's, it's very promising to know that now we have these new techniques like crowdfunding that can replace the, the patron system. And, and just what a huge, how amazing that we can make that transition, you know, just a wealthy kimono merchants basically donating everything to a lot, a really high number of people making micro donations. And, and we can make this transition between these two very different models in a pretty short period of time and have it work. I think that is just amazing. 
So this is Minami at Minami Kananyama. This is a photo of, they had a photo exhibit during the Gion Festival. This artist, he, here he's practicing, I think for the painting of a, the top of a temple ceiling, this artist. And um, he designed one of their textiles. He, he painted the dragon that then got woven into a textile Minami Kananyama. So um, I, I find that very interesting. So they're using the Gion Festival as a way to educate the public and give them a kind of added value. Come and see our floats, treasures, and also learn about the artists, learn about how art is made, right? Um, I, I didn't know this about how those ceiling temple paintings are made. And um, Minami Kananyama is doing very interesting things with um, that kind of contemporary presentation of, of traditional culture. So um, coming back to Ken's question about university students, and, and this comes to the Gion Festival community getting smaller as, um, as traditional homes and businesses are replaced with parking lots and high rises. Well, Kyoto is so rich in universities, as we all know. And so here are some university students who are volunteers. Again, this is Kankoboko. And at some floats, the university students will likely be um, taking your tickets or helping you take off your shoes or guiding you to, to where you get on the float. And um, they're, they're just super lovely to be around and, and very enthusiastic. And um, as I mentioned, this is Kankoboko and the university students that volunteer there each year. Because they couldn't this year, they made a video of Kankoboko for their YouTube channel. So for sure, like Ken is saying, there's some real promise to be developed there. And I think that it, it's happened very organically. Uh, I think Kankoboko may have been one of the first Ayagasa Boko so as a partnership with Bukyo University. And um, I'll speak about Ritsumeikan in a moment, which is also very active in the Gion Festival. And I think the universities are really waking up to the opportunities here. At Ayagasa Boko, the uh, university students are actually actually do field work during the festival for um, cultural studies, for studies in folklore and, and so on, and history. Um, again, university students, these are volunteers for the recycling and um, garbage sorting at the Gion Festival. The program just gets better and better every year. And the kids volunteering are, are super great. They're, they're just so enthusiastic and they're like, thank you for recycling and, you know, really make it kind of fun. They, they have a very ambitious um, Go Me Zero project. Um, zero garbage. It's going to um, take some effort to get there, but I just think that's fantastic that they have that aspiration. And so here we are at the Ritsumeikan se um, section. So this was a virtual Gion Festival exhibit at the Minpaku, at the Kyoto City museum, the one on Sanjo in that beautiful old post office building. So they sometimes hold these in person, often at that museum. And um, gosh, this was maybe in 2014 or so. And what we're looking at is um, two of the people here on the left, and actually three of the people there are from Ritsumeikan University. And what we're looking at on this TV screen is an enlarged textile that's just blown up so that you can see the individual um, needlework. Uh, those would be maybe clouds that we're looking at very close up. And so Ritsumeikan did very, very high quality digital scans, digital photography, I'm not, I'm not even sure what the technological terms would be, but very high quality digital copies of some of the artwork, the treasures at Fune Boko float. And that's related back again, the man who I dedicated this presentation to Nagai-san, he was at Fune Boko and he was very instrumental in, in helping this to happen. And so I just think that's so neat. Nagai-san, he did not have email. I, if I wanted to communicate with him, I had to call him or send him a letter. And yet he had the foresight to collaborate with Ritsumeikan University for this super high-tech cutting edge 
um, technology. And so what's so awesome about this is that now it's possible to research um, Fune Boko's treasures year round because we have these digital imagery. And um, doing research on Gion Festival anything is extremely challenging because it's basically only available for a month a year. It's raining, it's crowded, it's hot. Um, staff is limited, staff is busy putting on the festival. So, so Ritsu Meikan is really on this and um, is doing some very exciting work with uh, Fune Boko Float, also did some digital imagery at Hachiman Yama Float. And I believe they're also working with Takayama. And if you'd like to learn more about that, they are having a virtual digital exhibit museum this year. Ritsu Meikan is on, on a website and it, the link for that is on my gionfestival.org Facebook page. And uh, yeah, they're doing great work. So here's some of the other work that they're doing. This is my, my teacher and partner, Doug. And this was, we went together to see this is Ritsumeikan's technology. That's a phoenix, an embroidered phoenix on a textile at Funeboko, and it's on this touch screen. And you can, you know, just like an iPad, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, you can swipe and look at a different image. And, and it's, it's just great. And you can get closer. It's, it's very hard to get that close to the actual textile during the festival just because everyone's so busy, it's hanging on the float or maybe it's in storage and, and so on. And then the quality is so good that, um, yeah, I mean, since you can make it bigger, it's almost better than the real thing because you can't make the real thing bigger. And of course, there are limitations to that, but I hope you know what I mean. These are again, um, Ritz Mekon professor and his graduate student. And they're um, making a virtual Gion Festival procession there on the right in, in virtual reality, which is why the image looks a bit weird. And they're doing um, very cool things with, they can do it in contemporary times and then they, you can hit a button and it goes back a hundred years. And it shows what, for example, Shijo Street looked like a hundred years ago and what the float going down that street would have looked like. Okay, so um, that's it for uh, to make on that kind of research. I'd like to move to, we've talked about the communities uh, becoming smaller and becoming older. And there are some communities that are just doing amazing work with community vitalization. And these are some of the gentlemen at Ofune Boko, which was reintroduced in 2014. I spoke about their crowdfunding. And they've just done an incredible job. When you go there, you can feel the community is it, the float has really brought the community together. And, you know, here's people sp spending time together in the street. You can go there and still enjoy seeing one another. They're so excited about bringing the float back. They just love to talk about it. And uh, they've brought people who used to live in other cities have moved to the neighborhood to be a part of, of this endeavor. The man on the left uh, moved to Kyoto to be a part of this. And so again, I'm using Ofune Boko as a case study. So uh, they knew from paintings that there was a dragon on the prow of the ship. It burned down in the Great Fire of 1864. But they found in, in it, it's not unusual for in traditional Japanese Kyoto art, they would make two of things in case one was destroyed. And they found the one on the left was in a temple in Kyoto and they found it and they believed that it was the kind of the copy, the mate to the one that was on Funeboko. And so they used the one from the temple to make a new one, which is the one on the right. So they made this new dragon. The dragon was going to be featured in the Tokyo Olympics. I'm not sure what happened with that. But it's very interesting because now that temple has become a part of the Ofune Boko community. So they've, they've vitalized the community that the float is in and, and the community is, is getting bigger. It's, it's, it's a beautiful example of, um, you know, when a, in an era when loneliness is becoming such a problem and social isolation, it's really wonderful to see how people can reverse that process so constructively. And this is uh, the machia that Ofune Boko is uh, displayed in. And 
this Machia was the owner wanted to sell it and it was going to be bought by a real estate developer and everyone was afraid it would be knocked down and turned into a modern building. So the owner actually sold it to the um, neighborhood association so that it could be used for the float. And uh, someone came from out of town um, and rents to rent the building as their business place for 11 months out of the year and closes their business for the month of July so that the Gion Festival can, Ofune Boko can take over and he volunteers at Ofune Boko. And so, yeah, it's a, just a great example of how many birds they, they have fed with the one hand of, of Ofune Boko. And, and it's worth saying that the owner of the building, the previous owner of the building, sold the building for well below what he could have gotten for it because he wanted it to be conserved and, and wanted it to be a part of the game festival. So it was a very, very generous act. Gosh, it really shows you how much people really love, love the festival, love the traditions, and love the community. Now this is Todoyama, and Todoyama is doing some interesting things. They have a, a media professor is one of the um, kind of main patrons at Todoyama, and this is the praying mantis float. You can see on top of the float at left, it's an imperial ox cart, and on top of it is a praying mantis, and um, it's a Kuri, karakuri ningyo, which means it's an articulated like marionette, but it's a mechanism. It's, it's not, it is operated partly by people, but it's operated also partly by mechanistic means. And these karakuri ningyo are uh, um, experiencing a real revival right now because they're considered the prototype for modern robotics which is kind of cool. And this uh, praying mantis moves during the processions and is, is really one of the favorites of, of the public. It's, it's always fun when it goes by and moves because everyone goes, ah. Oh. Um, at any rate, I was just sitting here speaking to patrons, uh, Toro Yama patrons. And this one patron who's in a media studies professor, he says, well, this is media. This is how we communicate with our community. And he's pointing to the float and to the street. This is how we interface with our own community, with one another, and how we interface with the public. And so they're working with that very consciously in, in how they want to meet and interact with one another. And it's had a really great effect on, on their community too. It's a lot of modern apartment buildings, but a very active community participating very uh, earnestly and enthusiastically in the Gion Festival. They also use it very consciously to the Gion Festival to develop leadership skills in their community that then people can take to their workplace. So they very consciously are saying, they say like, okay, we're training up our next generation of leadership. And that's something that it's, it sounds so common sense, but, but very few, um, I, very few neighborhoods in the Gion Festival do it. And I think very few organizations worldwide do that. So I was really excited to, to hear about Toroyama doing that. This is, a, this is Toroyama float. And this is in the Minami Kanon Yama neighborhood. Um, at, at right, you can see that traditional building there, Kurochiku. That is a, a refurbished machia, a refurbished traditional building. <clears throat> And I'll speak about that in a minute with Minami Kanonyama. Oh, here we are. Okay, so this is the building across the street. I'm actually taking this building from the restaurant in the previous picture. So actually, let me go back. Um, this, this building on the right, Kurochiku, um, it was the first machia I ever encountered, the first traditional I building I ever encountered that had been upcycled into a restaurant. So that's different from a, a restaurant that had been in a traditional building. You know, there have been lots of those in Kyoto, of course, for ever. But Kurochiku was a, a residence that, that they refurbished to become a restaurant. And that was already when I was living in the neighborhood in the early 1990s that existed. And I didn't know of any others like it for quite 
some time. So this neighborhood was really a pioneer in that movement of, of transforming Machia into spaces for different uses and, and conserving them. And um, they continue to really be a pioneer in that area. Because if you look at the building here on the left, again, this is Minami Kanonyama. That building there on the left in the center of the image, that's a modern building. And they've just built it so sensitively that, that you can easily walk by it and just appreciate the historical ambiance, the cultural ambiance. I, I know that architectural diehards will immediately spot that it's a new building, but I hope you can appreciate that the average person may not. And one of the neat things about this building is that um, the property had been bought by a real estate developer. They knocked down, I think, between six six smaller machia, maybe eight, I can't, I can't remember, and they were going to build a high rise on it. And the neighborhood organized to prevent that from happening. And they were successful. And instead, they built this traditional replica that fit in really nicely with the cityscape and, and just adds a beautiful ambiance to give us a feeling for what the Gion Festival used to look like and how people used to enjoy it from the second story. And Minami Kananyama also has young women in their um, musical troupe. So uh, it's, it's so interesting when the tradition and the contemporary change can, can go well together. Um, so these are Yamabushi. Many of you will recognize these as Yamabushi. And um, Yamabushi have a really strong presence in the Gion Festival every year. I, every year, I, I feel like every year I go, I, I learn more about what Yamabushi do there. So there's two floats related to Yamabushi. So Yamabushi are a very interesting sect of Buddhism that is also very much about nature mysticism. They, they spend a lot of time in nature um, pursuing ascetic practices, spiritual practices in nature. They're known for hiking for long periods of time, sometimes in the shapes of mandalas and chanting prayers under waterfalls, things like that. And they, there's two floats related to one to the founder of their tradition, Enno Gyoja Yama, Enno Gyoja is the founder, and one is Yamabushi Yama, which is um, related to a famous Yamabushi with paranormal powers. He righted the Yasaka Pagoda when it was leaning. And so they go to those two floats every year and, and chant the Heart Sutra. And they chant the Heart Sutra elsewhere for world peace, and they do fire pujas for world peace. And you can write a prayer on a goma stick, on a wooden stick, and they'll burn it in their fire pujas. And they also, I, I believe that they visit every float. Uh, I didn't follow them. I followed them for a few floats, and then I had to go somewhere else. But they were walking from one float to another to another and saying the Heart Sutra at each float. And I've just been really impressed with the sincerity of their practice and their dedication. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's, it's the Gion Festival is really one massive ritual and then rituals within rituals within that. And, and so it's, um, yeah, for me, I, I just find it really lovely that, that they're saying the Heart Sutra, so that these sincere practitioners are saying the Heart Sutra for a successful festival. That means like a healthy one and a, a one without any harm and also for world peace. So again, when we go to the festival, if we know these things, then, you know, we can, we can be thinking that too while we're at the festival. We're there with all these people, it's kind of crowded, it's kind of irritating, but if we think of it through the lens of, you know, maybe this is just a big opportunity to think about world peace, it, it becomes a, a very different kind of experience. Okay, so I'm gonna come back and, and see again, if there are any questions, hi again. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, Ken and Paul, thank you for your question. The different chonai seem to be working independently. So that's a great point. The chonai are the neighborhoods. Each float, there's 34 floats, and each float is associated with a unique neighborhood. So there's 34 floats, 34 neighborhoods, simply put. And historically, they were completely independent of one another. They were, well, they were like interdependent. They would support one another if support was needed. Sometimes when one burned down, you know, they might get the old wheels from another one, that, that kind of thing. But basically they were autonomous. And, <coughs> excuse me, they, they are so busy with their own floats that they really don't have much time to know what one another is doing or find out what one another is doing. And um, that's one of the reasons I, I feel very excited that I've been able to spend time at all of the floats and that I can share, for example, the best practices in these case studies, because this is really helpful for the other floats to know. You know the other floats can be in a tough spot. And if they know what worked for another float, then, then that's a great option for them to move forward. Um, Now, is there an overall organization that enables development to be shared throughout the Gion Festival communities? I, I would say not really. There is the Yamaboko Rengokai, which is the Gion Festival Float Federation, and that is something like a central organizing body, but it's made up of people who are from the individual floats and they really want to honor the fact that the floats are autonomous that it's a very important feature of the festival because it builds in a certain resilience to the festival um, and as as we're discussing there's some downsides to that too the yamaboko federation i believe it was created mostly to help with the interface between the floats and the government so that funding applications could um, they, they help convey the funding applications, they help floats fill out the funding applications, they help the floats do what they need to do to get repairs done, which is ongoing. Um, okay, great. Oh, yeah, nice. Oh, hi, Mark. Yeah, thank you for sharing about Shugendo and Yamabushi. I have to really recommend Mark's site on Mark Productions. I've spent many a happy moment on your website, Mark. It's very informative and very, very well done. Okay. Um, so, so I have to say that the floats that I, I would say, so the festival is more than a thousand years old. The, the fortunes of the floats rise and fall. That's really clear. And a float can be kind of struggling because they, uh, for example, a, a, a major leader in their community may may die suddenly without a succession plan, and, and that float may really struggle with that leadership vacuum or vision vacuum. And then um, a few years later, someone can step into that leadership role and, and really bring it together. And that can happen within a decade. I've, I've seen that happen where a float can be struggling and then all of a sudden get revitalized. I knew leadership. So, um, but I would say that the floats that seem to be doing best are the ones that are really working with what we're talking about here, which is how to consciously move into the future, how to adapt to change. And I don't know about you guys, but that is something that I struggle with on a daily basis because of the, just the rapid, the, the, the nature of change in our era is, is so fast and um, how to adapt to that well is, is an ongoing question for us as individuals. And then you can imagine, so if you apply that to a 12 ton float and, a, and the entire community that supports that float and then the bigger community of the Gion Festival, it's, it's really quite an undertaking. And um, I hope you have a feeling for just how much I love this festival and I love this community and um, I, adore Kyoto and so I've really tried to write my book with with these kinds of concerns in mind to contribute positively to that conversation and to provide some resources to e explore further 
And I think there's just a phenomenal amount of research waiting to happen that that could um, open up the Gion Festival even more. You know, partly for the past, there's there's so many things, so many treasures that have yet to be well documented and and well interpreted and well curated. So so going into the past and and then moving into the future, and I think um, in particular as as Ken has been pointing out, I think the invitation to youth is a really exciting frontier for that. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to um, that, that connection growing stronger with young people. So, so like, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but as, as uh, communicators, as people active in media and um, arts, and education, uh, we have we're in a really great position to to help that to happen and to help that to happen well. So so I hope that you'll join me, and um, I hope you'll all consider me a, a resource to um, to help you to do that because uh, I I have a lot of material and I'd really like that to be used. And I think that is something like being done i'll um i'll just show i'll just flash here my um social media channels and my email so that people who would like to can take a screenshot and uh get in touch with me Yeah, sorry about that little pop-up window. That is new to me today. There's a woman um, praying at the shrine next to the Otabi show, next to the visiting place. This is Kita Kanonyama, the first float I ever saw. Um, and they're playing the Gion Festival of music, which is derived from the predecessor to no theater music. And, and no, as many of you know, no theater is designed to communicate with other between the human realm and other realms. And uh, the, the music is designed to facilitate that. It's also a kind of requiem for the departed because everybody on this float, remember, if say 50 years ago they all had family members who had died during july they would be thinking about them every gion festival like oh they're, they're not here this year i remember that time when they were and so on there's the naginata boko chigo these were in case we had extra time that's a, a demon deity at enno gyojayama that's the old Matsuzakaya that I, has been replaced by the hotel that, that we saw before. And there's the Ato Matsuri procession. It's just stunning. That's on July 24. And everybody's pretty tired by the end. <laughs> That's just <laughs> how we all feel on <laughs> the 24th after the procession. Okay, so here are my different, uh, that's my website and my different social media channels and an email where you can reach me. And um, you're welcome to get in touch. I, I do have my head down right now, um, getting the finishing touches done on my book. So, so forgive me if I take a while to get back to you, but I, but I will do so. And um, here's my book cover. I really look forward to sharing more with you through my book and um yeah please spread the word and you can always um get in touch on on social media if you'd like to have a conversation there well, Catherine, i know you can't see the chat right now but we did have another question come in or maybe two here i am okay hey, you're welcome how much of a financial and organizational role does Yosaka Shrine and the 3000 Nationwide Yagama Shrines play in the Gion Festival? Um, 
That's a really good question. I think um, it, de it depends what you mean. It plays a huge role in the Gion Festival. The Yasaka Shrine is absolutely central to the Gion Festival and it's somewhat independent. It's um, the floats, they're connected with the Yasaka Shrine, but I wouldn't say they're, I, the Yasaka Shrine isn't really organizing much that the floats do. The Yasaka Shrine really concerns itself with the parts that happen at Yasaka Shrine and related to the Mikoshi, to the portable shrines, the golden ones that they carry on their shoulders. So that is all Yasaka Shrine. The Hanagasa Junko takes place, the flower umbrella float procession, um, orients around Yasaka Shrine. It's very involved in that. There's rituals that happen at Yasaka Shrine, very involved in that. But if you ask them about the floats, they would probably defer to the floats. And same financially, I, I believe they're quite separate, except for the rituals, there would be some financial um, collaboration in order for the rituals to take place at Yasaka Shrine. So, so I hope that answers your question. Um, it it's, can get a bit detailed and a bit complicated, but that's Kyoto for you. Right. Oh, Jeremy Pine is here. So, uh, Jeremy, let, I hope you don't mind. Thanks for coming, Jeremy. So, Jeremy Pine, I met in my first summer at the Gion Festival in 1993. He's an international textile expert, and Jeremy was one of the first to recognize the, the tremendous value of some of the Gion Festival textiles and the very unusual nature of the Gion Festival textiles. At the very beginning, I showed you an image of one of the textiles and um, Jeremy has this amazing theory that I, I think is very compelling that those are the ones I mentioned that there's a lot in the Gion Festival, but there are very few worldwide. And so because there's a lot in the Gion Festival, people just take them for granted. And Jeremy um, pointed out their rarity and their value. And his theory is that they came to Japan with Kublai Khan's army when they attacked Japan in the 14th century. And I have to hand it to Jeremy when he first came out in this theory, with this theory, people just thought that was outrageous. And recently, the Metropolitan Museum of Art featured one of these Gion Festival textiles in an international exhibit on the artwork of the reign of Kublai Khan and, and said that it was made during that era under Kublai Khan. So I have to hand it to Jeremy for um, his his insights and his willingness to stand by his, his theories so stalwartly. And um, so that's a great example of what I mean about the research that's waiting to happen. Very 20 years later, someone else confirmed Jeremy's theory, but there has not been a lot of research done on these textiles. And um, more could be done to explore this connection with Kublai Khan and how they got to, to Japan. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of exciting things waiting to happen in the Gion Festival, and that's just one example. Um, okay, well, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this. I think I, it's been a real pleasure to share this with you. Thanks again to Writers in Kyoto, to John and to Lisa, and to the Kyoto Journal, always for your support. Uh, there'll be a review of my book in the next Kyoto Journal. And uh, if you haven't subscribed, it's a wonderful publication to subscribe to. And I will pass it back to you, Lisa. Catherine, thank you so much. It has been an amazing couple of hours hearing about this. And I know I'm going to check out some of those resources you mentioned and you know, look at things up close um, online. All right, so I'll end it there. I guess, you know, if anybody just wants to hang around and try to get that last question in, um, you're welcome to do that. But I think this is a good time to first all thank Catherine and, uh, and say our farewells. So you can unmute yourself at will now. <laughs> Free time. All right. Thanks, Catherine. Thanks, Catherine. That was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Very welcome. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Wonderful. Very welcome, my great pleasure. Great slides, great pictures. I enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hope to see you all in Kyoto this time next year. Hopefully. Likewise. Yeah.
<laughs> okay. Um, Catherine, thank you for the, for the uh, call out, the, the shout out for KJ. Appreciate that. <laughs> oh, my pleasure. My pleasure, really. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, so good to see you. Uh, thank you for coming. Nice to see you too. Nice talk. Well, thank you. Yeah, very nice. Okay. Um, I'll be in touch. Yes. Okay. Thanks so much, Lisa. Oh, my pleasure. All right. We're dwindling down to the last ones. Who's going to be the last man standing? So <laughs> like we, we can all just say our, our collective yeah. goodbyes here and I'll, I'll shut it down. <laughs> all right. Good day and good night. Thank you.